Messiah. The Messiah is going to come. He's going to come at this time at the 69th weeks of years, and he is going to meet a violent death, but it will not be for nothing. I'm just kind of paraphrasing it all down. And then the last two verses of that portion, Daniel 9, 24 to 27, speaks about what will happen in the end times. But we're not talking about that today. The Hebrew follow, the Hebrew uh, sages of that time in history called that first century A.D., the great age of messianic expectation. They were looking for the Messiah. And the reason they were is because they had Daniel's prophecy. Now let's go back to the doorpost and the lintel. Jesus did come at the right time in history. Jesus was nailed to a cross and had a crown of thorns thrust into his head. And his blood was poured out for you. Some believe, and I think there's some sense that we can believe this, that the picture of the doorposts being painted with blood of an animal, lamb, and the lintel is a foreshadowing of what Messiah would have to go through centuries later, about 1,400 years after. And God's word is accurate. We have the privilege living at this time in history. We can look at it and look at all of the prophecies that spoke about the first coming of Messiah and how each and every one of them were fulfilled to the letter. Well, you know what my people say about the book of Daniel? They don't study it. They don't study it for a number of reasons. Some rabbinic sources say, well, it really isn't an accurate book. It's, it's too accurate. They, they contradict themselves. It's too accurate because all the things that they claim whoever wrote Daniel, they don't even think that Daniel wrote it, it all happened. It, it was too easy for it to happen like that because all those nations came. Rome came, Greece came, Persia came, Babylon came. I went backwards of the great image of Daniel in chapter 3 of his, his prophecy. But what they don't see is that it happened like that, and Daniel received it and wrote it down like that because they were to hear what God had in store for them. The sad part for my people, like I still see when we attend a Passover Seder. By the way, it's not a Seder meal. Let me correct that for you. A lot of people call it the Seder meal. The meal is the Seder. That's what it means. It's, it's the Passover Seder. And we have, and you'll have them on your table. We'll look at them later. It's uh, an Haggadah. The word Haggadah means order of service because there's an order to what things, uh, how things are done at the Passover table. Just as there was an order here that God gave through Moses and Aaron to give to Israel. He says that God will pass through the land and judge is, uh, Egypt on that night. And any, any house that did not have the blood on the doorpost and the lintel is where that firstborn male would die. We're actually going to look at verses 13 and 14 today. Look what it says in verse 13 about the blood. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Well, God will pass over through the land and judge. But that blood was a picture that the Hebrew people were to put on their doorposts and they were to remain in their homes and they were to wait for the judgment to come and go. And the judgment did come and go that night. And then in verse 14, it says this. Now this day, see where you uh, follow with me, please, in verse 14. This day, one day, will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Now, here in the church, we have two ordinances, the Lord's table and baptism. 
These are the only things that we are required to do. Well, I'm a Jewish person, and I get a third ordinance. And that's what you just read there. The Passover. I remember the Passover. I remember it now as a Jewish believer, not because I have to remember it. I have to tell you that I remember it now because I want to remember it. You're not required to keep the Passover. But if you were to be a very forward individual and you would want to come and celebrate the Passover with us and you called me up and said, can we come and celebrate the Passover with you next week? I'd have to say to you, sorry, this year it's a full house. My kids, uh, are my grandkids are coming from Toronto and they have first dibs. <laughs> the Passover is a very involved preparation in fact, Hillary started cooking for this Passover last night, yesterday afternoon. And it gets put in the freezer and gets put in the fridge and everything becomes overflowing everywhere. And there are so many other things. So we keep the Passover. We remember it. It's a memorial for us. Like I said, you're, you're, you can... Be forward. Perhaps maybe next year you can be forward and you can call me up and say, I'd like to come to Passover at your house. And then I'll just say to you, well, it'll be nine ninety five a person and no other cover charge. I won't do that with you. But if you recall a few, a few moments ago when we took communion, I made some applications to you about, for you about those things. Now, let's look at some of those applications a little more in depth. First of all, let's look at the parallels of a lamb being killed and the blood and what happened shortly after Jesus celebrated Passover. First of all, the lamb was killed. Just as we read here in Exodus 12, the lamb was killed. And in Matthew 26, verses 26 to 30, you can read all about that and everything that happened there. Now, we just read in Exodus 12 about how you had to take the, the Hebrews had to take the lamb, lamb's blood and paint it on the two doorposts. Well, you don't need to do that, and I don't need to do that either. In fact, we don't do that. We, we don't kill a lamb at Passover, and we don't spread blood on the doorposts of our house. It happened one time and one time only. But do you remember, right at the beginning of the Gospel of John, if, if you're a, a fervent reader in the Scriptures, that Jesus came out to the wilderness where his cousin John was baptizing. And in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the baptizer saw his cousin coming, who was Jesus, and he exclaimed this about him. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So there's an application we can make from the first and only Passover that ever happened and the blood painted on the doorposts and then the, the angel of death passing over. The blood on the doorposts happened one time only in Egypt. But since Jesus went to that cross almost 2,000 years ago now and spilled his own blood on your behalf, he now makes an opportunity for you to paint the blood that he spilled on your behalf on the doorposts of your heart. And the question I have to ask you today, and I never take it for granted in any place I go to speak like this on a Sunday morning, I never take it for granted that everybody I'm speaking to in the audience has made a profession of faith in who the Messiah is. And my question to you before we finish today, and for you to ponder on it as we, we come to a close, have you painted the blood of Jesus onto the doorpost of your heart? Are you truly born again? Now, if you go back, you have some of that background about the first and only Passover that ever took place. Whoops, I just lost my marker. 
and I want to make sure I don't lose that place, so I'll use another marker. If you go to back to Matthew chapter 26, we look again at the different things that were on the table. Now let me get up over here. You should have in your table a, a small bowl that is supposed to have salt water in it. And then it has sprigs of celery. And this is one of the things that is, was done on the Passover table, and, and Jesus did it as well. They had already, look at Matthew 26, verse 19, they prepared the lamb, and then they were eating, and then he says, one of you is going to betray me. And he says, it's the one of you that dips in the bowl. So you see that bowl there has salt, salt water. And what is done at the Passover meal is, you, t you see this sprig of celery? If you were to take it and just eat it now without the salt water, it would be rather bitter, wouldn't it? Well, that's the, imp that's the picture. Now, don't eat it yet. Okay. The Hebrew peoples keep this ritual of bitter herbs and salt water and a lot of other things, too. We, like I said, we forgot the herosis at home. I won't be able to do that that illustration with you, it's supposed to represent the brick and mortar, and you make what's called the Hillel sandwich and all kinds of other things. We weren't going to do that anyways, but it was going to make it available for you to see. And they took the bitter herbs. The bitter herbs and salt water is supposed to, in the Hebrew mind, represent the bitterness of slavery and the, and the tears of slavery. And the, the Passover meal and the Haggadah the reading forth, the telling forth of all these things in order, you are supposed to remember what it was to come out of Egypt into the Exodus and go back to, and finally go to the land. And bitter herbs of slavery and salt water, well, take it right now, take, dip some bitter herbs, And there is a prayer that is, that is pronounced over the bitter herbs and, uh, before you eat it. It's Baruch atah Adonai lehinam elech alam, borei prihad dama. And it means, blessed art thou, Lord our God, it brings forth the green things out of the earth. And so when you eat this, you're remembering the bitterness of slavery and the tears of slavery. So eat this. Isn't it tasty? I'm not making light of it. In this case, though, in Matthew 26, the bitterness that it's being spoken of here is the bitterness that will befall the one who betrayed Jesus. And that's why when Judas says to him, it's not I, is it, uh, teacher, rabbi? And what does Jesus say? You have said it yourself. Now, we took the matzah already, and we ate it. And I explained to you that it's a, it's a picture of his broken body, broken for you. And you took it in remembrance of Jesus. And then there was the cup that we took. And I explained to you that that cup was the fourth cup of the meal. Now, I'm going to tell you what the other three cups represent, and then you'll understand, I hope, and I think, what the cup of acceptance means. The first cup is the cup of blessing. And the cup is taken at the beginning of the meal. It's, it's Mine's empty over there, and so are yours on the table, and that doesn't matter. If there are some there, you can take it. But you take that cup, and you bless the meal, the proceedings, the things that are going to be spoken of that you're going to read through in the Haggadah for the next, sometimes I can remember Passover meals lasting four and five hours. Yes, that long. And they didn't talk about take this, eat this as my body. They talked about the bitterness of slavery. And in some respects, they talked about the bitterness of having to do this for four, five, and six hours. Some, some even go well into the early, early morning, depending on how observant a Hebrew you are. The first cup of blessing 
the whole thing, the whole meal, and the whole story is blessed. Then the story of redemption out of slavery in Egypt begins to unfold as you read through in the Haggadah. And you take the second cup, which is called the cup of redemption. When you are redeemed as a follower of Jesus, the Greek word in the New Testament speaks about being redeemed out of slavery. It was a word that was pur purposely used by the Apostle Paul to talk about, he used a word, he misused it, but it was to talk about a slave that was bought in the marketplace. You and I, before we became followers of Jesus, were slaves to sin. You have been redeemed, bought by God himself through the blood that he spilled on your behalf that I asked you earlier. Have you applied the blood of the Lamb, Messiah, to the two doorposts of your heart? And then you know you have redemption. The third cup is called the cup of deliverance. And it speaks about those things in Exodus 12 and how God delivered Israel out of slavery. And he delivered Israel out of slavery because the firstborn male died and Pharaoh was not God. And they saw that God was God. And they actually gave their gold and the wealth of Egypt to them and said, get out of here, we want you gone and we want you to take your plagues with you. Well, there was one last plague that happened at the Red Sea because Pharaoh was such a prideful man that he went after them to get them again, and God gave Israel a way across the Red Sea, and the waters came across and put the Pharaoh's armies to death. Now, you measured a great kingdom at that time in history by how powerful your army was. And Egypt was the leading country or, or kingdom in the world. And Pharaoh watched as his army was literally washed away in front of him. There's another picture there as well. And that picture was that Pharaoh was finally defeated. But there was Israel on the other side of the, of the Red Sea. And there was no going back to Egypt. There was no going back to slavery. There was no going back to things that were not of God. And so you see there's also a picture there that if you truly have become a follower of Jesus and put the blood that were on those doorposts in Egypt but symbolically applied it to your heart, there's no going back. Once you are truly born again, you belong to God. We call that the doctrine of eternal security. And there it is all the way back in Exodus chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, the whole story coming out of Egypt. And that's why we say, why can't our people see it? Well, one day they might. Now it says that when it was all done, they, they took the fourth cup. And you can take that cup right now again if you want. That's why there are extras on the table. And you're taking the fourth cup, the cup of acceptance. And why? You can take that fourth cup at communion if you've accepted Jesus. Remember I spoke about that earlier? This was the picture here at that Passover. And that's why we say to folks when they come to um, communion here at church with you, if you're, not, if you're not truly understanding what it means to be a follower of Jesus, don't take the cup today. Don't take the bread. Don't take the cup today but come and talk to us after, and we'll try and get this straight, help you get this straightened out so you understand why. You see, Jesus didn't take this fourth cup, and the reason was very obvious. The majority, but not the entirety, of the house of Israel had rejected him. And that happened because it was prophesied that it would happen. And it, it tore, I believe it tore Jesus' heart apart to see that he was rejected by his own. But it fulfilled everything that's written in Isaiah chapter 52, starting at verse 13, right through Isaiah chapter 53, referred to by, uh, by some as the forbidden chapters of Isaiah. I've shown that to Jewish people, and they look at it and they go, man, that sounds like your God. And I say, it's in your book. And I can always remember one particular fellow in Ottawa. He was just 
Jewish guy I had been I spent years speaking to about Jesus, and the day that he read that standing in front of me, his eyes just kept getting wider and wider. And he became so agitated at the end, and he just said to me, I can't believe this because the book opens on the wrong side. He was reading an English Bible. English is read from left to right, right? Well, it's backwards. Hebrew is an older language. It's read from right to left. So English came later, and anyways. So Jesus didn't take that fourth cup because Israel, as a majority but not the entirety, had rejected him. Now, you read in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, when the church came into existence, there were 120 people, give or take, in that upper room. I always say it like this, 118 Jewish people, two Gentiles. It doesn't matter who was there. Were you, are you, a follower of Jesus? It took another seven chapters of the book of Acts for the Jewish believers, one of them by the name of Peter, to realize the gospel is going out to the Gentiles because that great, that vision of that great white sheet of all that unclean animals, I can't eat that God. And he says, what was once unclean is now clean. Why? Because I'm sending you to talk to a Gentile man who's going to invite you for dinner because he wants to find out about who my son is and you need to go tell him. And the Holy Spirit came upon the house of Cornelius, and those people believed. And Peter said, now we know what it means, the gospel to the Gentiles. So here we are in this room, and I don't know how many people are in here, and I don't know if there are any other Jewish people. Well, let's say 120 20 people in this room, 117 Gentiles, three Jewish people. Not much has changed, just reversed a little bit. And then it says this. I won't drink this fruit of the vine until I drink it with you new in my Father's kingdom. And I sometimes have wondered as if he's going to conclude that that Passover meal never ended because Jesus was the head of that household. And until he took that fourth cup, the Passover meal isn't over. So I consider that Passover meal to be a meal in suspension. And I wonder if it's after the rapture that Jesus is going to, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, he's going to take that fourth cup. Here are the ones who accepted me, and that Passover meal will come. And then will come the other events that will happen on planet Earth. It says in Matthew 26, they sang a hymn, and they went out. It wasn't on an overhead. It wasn't onward Christian soldiers. The hymn book of Israel is the book of Psalms. And these hymns that are sung at the Passover are called the great Hallel. The word Hallel in Hebrew, which is the, uh, the first part of the word uh, we read phonetically, Hallelujah, which means praise to God, Yah, Yahweh, praise to God. Hallel means praise. The great Hallel is Psalms 113 through 118. They are read in their entirety. You find it in the, in the Haggadah at the end. You read them in order, Psalms 113 through 118. But I, I'm not going to read all of that with you because it's 1119, and we would, should stop soon. But I want you to turn to Psalm 118, please. Specifically, I want you to look starting at verse 22. Now remember, I said to you a few moments ago, but I think it may have just broken the heart of Jesus that he knew that his people, the majority, not the entirety, but the majority, had rejected him as the Messiah. You can read in the Gospel of John, he, he presented himself, he, he told the, the uh, Sanhedrin of Israel, he said, before Abraham was, I am, he declared himself as God. And that's in John chapter 8. And then in John chapter 10 at the feast of the, the dedication, which is Hanukkah, they came and they surrounded him in the temple and they said, if you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And Jesus said, plainly, I told you, but you don't believe me. Before Abraham was, I am. I told you, but you don't believe me. And then you start here in Psalm 118, in verse 22. Follow with me, please. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. 
This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. And then these words, verse 26. In the Hebrew, they sound like this. Baruch haba Hashem Adonai. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God and he has given us light. Bind the festival sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, I give thanks to you. You are my God, I extol you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving, his loving kindness is everlasting. You see, Jesus is the chief cornerstone that has been rejected by my people of the house of Israel. And every year they read this at the end of the Hallel. And then you read, you read on, it was the doing of God, and it's marvelous in our eyes. And then you read, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How many times have you may have sung that as a, as a, uh, a small uh, uh, hymn or whatever, and you think it's about coming to worship here on Sunday? Well, there's nothing wrong with preaching, or reach, um, singing that and, and thinking that. There's nothing wrong with coming to, to church on Sunday to be with other believers. But this day that's being spoken of here in Psalm 118 is the day that God set apart from the beginning of time where he would send his son to go to die the most ignominious, horrible death, spilling his blood on your behalf. And then we are to rejoice in that. And then we are to, if we understand it like that, we can say, Blessed is the one who came in the name, comes in the name of the Lord. You see, on the preparation of Sunday of that week, the week leading up to Passover, the week that he died, leading up to what we, we celebrate here in the church for Easter, there is Palm Sunday. And the prophet Zechariah spoke about that in chapter 9 of his prophecy, where there would be one who would come on the colt of a donkey, and palm branches would be spread out. They were welcoming their king. On the first day of the week, Jesus was welcomed as the king. But within five or six days, they were telling, telling Pontius Pilate, crucify him, we want Barabbas. Isn't it sad how sin can do that? And then one day, one man can be seen as the Messiah, and five or six days later, he is saying, I will not come back to this house until I really hear from deep down inside the hearts of my people, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's going to happen. Zechariah the prophet speaks about that. One third of the house of Israel will finally look on him whom they have pierced. Zechariah 12, verse 10. Zechariah 13, verses 8 and 9. But before that happens, it's going to be a hard day for the people of the house of Israel. And even in some way, there's a foreshadowing of how the world is reacting to Israel right now. That is a geopolitical entity over there. But it is still the, in the land that God promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there are believers in Jesus there sharing the gospel with Jewish and Gentile people alike. We know some of them. And the gospel is going out in Israel. And it may seem like it's a bleak time right now for Israel, but God is still sovereign, and he's still on the throne, and he will save his people. If he saved you, it's going to save you. Jesus was the Passover offering. Have you applied his blood to the doorpost of your heart? Have you recognized him as Baruch haba Hashem Adonai? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I hope in some small way today I've been able to share with you here so that you understand who Messiah is, what he did 
at that last Passover he celebrated and what's coming future for all of us. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you have allowed for us to be here today to look at these things in your word that we still have the freedom to meet here. And we ask now your blessing from this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stick around, please, and join us for our fellowship meal. We'd love to get to know you better. Benediction today, and, and before I read that, just a reminder, if you need prayer, uh, our prayer team's up at the front. We'd love to pray with you, um, even to give thanks to God for something. Um, if you prefer to write it down and put it in the, the tithes and offering box, just feel, to, feel free to write that down, and I'll get to our prayer team or to our staff and our elders, and we'll pray for that for you. Number six, 24 to 26. Some of you know this well. Maybe you sing it to your kids. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace. God bless you. <laughs>